Right. Uh, good afternoon, all. Great to see uh, such a such a big audience and so much interest this morning. Um, so I'm going to do a quick review of where where we are with the ports down. Look at the team. Uh, look at some of the new capabilities, the brew capabilities. Yes, all right. Um, and and next steps. What do you want? Uh, because I. I don't get a lot of feedback from the port stand except this button doesn't work or it doesn't do the right thing. So it'd be nice to have some positive feedback about what, what you'd like. Okay, the last year, we've gone from uh, when I last stood up here back in Finningley, we had 170 users. We've now got about 280 people who have bought things from the shop and I'm sure there are more. Uh, there is certainly at least one French guy who buys lots of SD cards and farms them out to his friends. Um, guys at the back, would you like to come down? There's at least two seats at the front here. Um, Six. Good. Sold over 100 SD cards um, and filter modulator boards. And, of course, we've got filter modulator boards here in the shop today at a reduced price. So uh, grab one today while you can, please. Uh, we've done about 20 software updates. The, one of the things we tried to do early on was make sure that the, uh, the equipment was capable of being updated from the internet without having to rebuild the card every time. Uh, so there have been about 20 of those issued. Um, and more to come. Support for new hardware. Uh, we'll have a look at the new hardware in a minute. And we've migrated to the Stretch operating system. Every couple of years, the Raspberry Pi Foundation update the operating system. Um, and we've had to migrate to the new one to take account of the Raspberry Pi 3B+, the latest version, which only sensibly runs with the new operating system. One of the things uh, when I first started the project, I realised that a Raspberry Pi with a touch screen and some other bits on it is a really useful device for doing all sorts of other things. So I really want it to be the TV Amateur's Toolbox. And we've done a few bits on that this year. But still plenty of scope. Um, I'm pleased to welcome some new members to the Portsdown team. Heather's made some contributions this year and Ray and Tim both uh, welcome anybody else who thinks they can do something useful with the, Raspberry, with the Portsdown hardware. It'll be really good to have ideas about what else I can put into it. Um, just email me with an idea. Um, and. Uh, if you've got some code to go with the idea, even better. So about 18 months ago, we started with this single screen. And in fact, the first screen that I had running didn't have, even have frequencies along the bottom. So you could just select the symbol rate, the FEC, and the, the transmission source. Um, I mean, that was a good start <coughs> at that time. Uh, but uh, it really was quite limiting in what we could achieve. So around last Christmas, uh, I finally bit the bullet and amended the software so that it supported multiple menus. And this is where we are today, where, uh, where most of the buttons bring up a menu to select the um, parameter that's on them. And that has given me lots of flexibility. We're now up to about 35 different menus to set things on there. And I've been trying to migrate away from people having to use PuTTY and a PC to set parameters to, yes, you can set them from the touchscreen. So you can now set your call sign, your locator from the touchscreen. There are a few exceptions there. You still can't configure the wireless. Um, I, that's on, high on the to-do list now. Um, but we're getting there in, in moving most of the functions to the touchscreen. screen. 
On the hardware side, we've uh, come up with some new developments as well. Um, I think the most visually impressive one is the seven inch touch screen, um, which really makes a difference. And there's one of the port stands I've seen this morning, which is in a box not much larger than this box with this screen on. Looks really fantastic, really easy to control. Uh, more expensive, but really does look good and work well. Uh, we've also um, looked at putting in a variable attenuator so that you can drive your PAs to exactly the right level. An eight band RF switch so that you can drive PAs for 71 megs, 146, 437, 1255 and four transverters. I'm sorry if four transverters isn't enough but that's all we're doing. <laughs> Um, and to, do, to go with that, we've got a DC decode board as well, so you can actually switch that lot without having to swap your phono plugs around. The seven inch screen, um, the old screen, the three and a half inch screen, only updates uh, about three times a second. That's because it uses the GPIO pins to get its data out of the Raspberry Pi very slowly. That means you get the very jerky pictures when you've got pictures on it, and it's not that responsive to touch. Also, we've had some reliability problems with them. Um, the seven inch screen here is sold by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, oh, sorry, organised by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, sold by Farnell. It has got ongoing support. Um, the, I suppose the only bugbear with it is when they originally developed the screen, they designed the software for it to be that way up. They then realised that when it's that way up, you can't see it very well. So they said, all right, we'll put it that way up. So some software displays the image upside down to start with. Um, and some boxes try and mount it that way up. Um, so we, there are some issues about orientation. Um, you can switch it, though. Just going to go through some of the new capabilities. Um, a lot of us have started playing with 5.6 gig drone transmitters and you know, we've done all this digital stuff so we've got rid of our analog cameras. So what do you do? Well, you use a ports down. Um, can you all see this, this screen reasonably easily here? The biggest ports down screen in the world. Um, if you select output to composite video here, and then press transmit, you get this fairly ugly screen. Um, but this is the screen you can then use to provide a video source for your 5.6 gig transmitter. The PTT on, on off switch there drives, <coughs> I can hear myself somewhere, I'm not sure where, oh it's uh, from this thing. Um, the PTT on off switch drives uh, the 70 meg relay, so you can actually use that PTT on off switch to switch your uh, 5.6 gig transmitter. You can then switch video sources, so you can switch the Pi camera, which is a, a jaunty angle there looking at the room. So you can use a digital camera with your analog 5.6 gig kit. If you go back to that, uh, oh, you're doing a contest. Let's have the contest numbers up. Illegal contest numbers, that's to make you change them. Right. Um, if you want the great bouncing balls, you can have the great bouncing balls. Um, that, you'll, you'll note that's smooth. When that is used with the digital side, there is a little bit of software conflict and we've had to slow it down and hence it's jerky. On, on that video output, it's smooth. Uh, test card. Nice test card there, 
but perhaps you want to do something different. If you touch the right hand side of the screen, uh, sorry, bottom right quarter there, it will go on to a different test card. Or, or perhaps you want that one. Or you'd like some colour bars. Or if your kit's really old, you can have some of those. Um, or if you want to test your kit, there's a Pulsen bar. You'd be surprised how good the video output on the um, Raspberry Pi is. That looks really good on a scope um, in raw form. So those are there as video outputs. And this comes back to it, it being a toolkit for the shack. Um, you can go either way on those by touching left or right of screen. If you touch the centre of the screen, you get back to there. Um, the last thing on there is something called Snap. Um, sorry, double, double clicked. Ah, oh, there aren't any there. If you have taken snapshots of the video input from the EasyCap, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute, you can display those on the video output. Um, you can also select which band. Do you remember we had that contest caption up, which was for 70 sem? Well, actually, I wanted the contest caption for three SEMs. So it then brings up the contest caption for three SEMs with the numbers that you've previously input for three <coughs> SEMs. So you can do it for any band. And that band selection there is independent of the radio frequency band selection. Um, exit out of that and go back to transmitting as a port stem. There we go. Um, next feature, lean, the Lean DVB receiver. This isn't your, a receiver that in any way competes with Minitune. It is just a facility to receive digital TV on your ports down. So now, instead of when you select uh, receive, it going straight into the receiver with the transmitter's parameters, it takes you to a menu that looks a lot like the transmit parameter selection menu but you can select different parameters to the transmitter. So you can set it to your re local repeater output whilst you have the transmitter on the, tr on the transmit parameters. Um, it will receive H.264 or MPEG-2, but it'll only decode the MPEG-2 if you have bought the license. It's really expensive. It's £2.40 from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, and available online and it takes all of about six hours to arrive in your inbox. But it's worth doing if you want to use this receiver for MPEG-2. Um, currently it only works with the RTL-SDR, the internal RTL-SDR that you'll all have thought about putting in your ports down even if you haven't. Um, there is potential to get it working with the LIME-SDR and that will be coming in a future release. The reason it isn't as good as the mini tuner is it does not do Viterbi error correction. So you need an error free signal for it to get a picture. The moment you get a digital error, either it'll throw a picture artifact or it'll just crash. So you need the signal to be between 6 and 10 dB stronger than you would for mini tune. But Across the shack, for demos, for, for testing in the room, it works. Uh, along the, the bottom of the screen there, you've got presets. You can, of course, set the presets in exactly the same way as you can in, in most of the places I've mechanised the preset. Um, in that you press store preset, the button goes red to say... The next preset you store, you press, will store the current um, setting. So if you press that one again, it asks you what name you want. So you can use the keyboard to put in the name. You enter the name, and then it's stored that preset. So we've talked about receiving video. Um, what about receiving audio? 
Um, if you go to menu 2, there's an RTL-FM receiver there. The current production version, I have got to admit, does not work very well. I made a few errors. Um, I hope to release a version next week with this software, this is the development software, um, where I do actually set the gain for the RTL-SDR. Those of you who have used RTL-SDRs and left the gain at zero, it works fine across the shack. The moment you try and receive anything useful, you can't hear a thing. Um, anyway, you can now set the gain. It needs to be about 30 for narrowband FM. It needs to be about uh, up at the maximum, which is 50 for amplitude modulation. Uh, and again, in this, you can store presets. So it's just another receiver to have around the, the shack. You do, of course, need an audio amplifier on, on the output of your uh, Raspberry Pi, on the audio output of your Raspberry Pi to uh, listen to it. I've got one built into here. Um, but I didn't tune any of the channels before I came in. When you've used that, and if you've used the output of the, ras the audio output from the Raspberry Pi, it has used the pulse width modulator in the Raspberry Pi for audio. It then can't use it to do ports down type transmissions. Um, this one, actually that output came from the USB audio dongle, which it is programmed to use if available. But you, will, you can get a warning screen up that says un the, uh, that unable to transmit because you've used the, ports to, uh, used the audio output. Um, then you need to reboot the machine and then it will work perfectly again. Uh, stream viewer. Again on menu two, all the useful things are on menu two. So you can select, if your ports down is connected to the internet, which this one isn't, you can select one of the uh, streams on there and view it. Um, and those, you can pre-program which stream you're looking at from menu three. Basically anything that involves setting a configuration is on menu three. Things you do things with are on menu two. Stream viewer, that's how it looks. One of the things I do is go out portable from my ports down. I don't operate from home at all. Uh, so I need to know what, where to point my microwave aerial from various hilltops. So, of course, the ports down as a computer can calculate that. So, if you want... You've got a distance station, say uh, G8, not that I ever work in portable, G GTZ portable is out there on a... On a I'll tell you where he currently is. Remember? Where is he then? He's in Italy Oscar 9-2 Golf India. He's in Italy Oscar 9-2 Golf India. And because this is a Portsdown, it's based at Portsdown Hill. So from Portsdown Hill, it, Italy Oscar 92 Gulf India is 351 degrees, 168 kilometers. Each time you put in a new station in this list, the one, off the, one gets dropped off the bottom, simply gets deleted. But at least you can recall back to that. There is a second list, which is site beacon bearings, this, this fella here. Be nice to be able to touch that one. And before you go portable, if you want beacons or know what common sites are, are going to be out there, going to be in use, you can put these in and they don't get overwritten. That's just a list of 10 sites that, that live in the machine. So, you know, I, I use Bell Hill Beacon for a lot of my microwave stuff. That's in there. Um, I mentioned the Raspberry Pi 3B+. Um, 
It takes a lot more power. It's the same price. It goes about 20% faster. It doesn't add a lot to the ports down. Um, I think at four mega symbols, if you're trying to encode the test card, it might encode the test card uh, without dropping out as often. Uh, but you know, there's not a lot actually in it. However, more and more people are going to be buying them. And for that reason, we had to move to Raspberry and Stretch, this new operating system. That's caused me quite a few problems in that things that worked perfectly well in Jesse did not work properly in Stretch. Some of you might have noticed your Raspberry Pis don't shut down when you press the shutdown button. They sort of hang on the shutdown screen. Um, I think I've cured that in the release that came out last week. Um, it, basically, th I hadn't updated everything that I should have done. It's all a learning experience. A um, couple of other things that I just wanted to check. How many of you have used the signal generator in the port stem? Yeah. Three, four, five. Really useful. And I, I tend to use it on this box in that this sits on the bench in the shack. Menu two, signal generator, when you press the button properly, and goes straight into that. You can then, on the frequency screen, just select what frequency you want. It tells you what the output level is and you can provide some adjustment of the output level. But any frequency between 35 megs and 4.2 gigs. Really useful. Um, next one, Spectrum Viewer. Let's do it on here because uh, the Spectrum Viewer does not play nicely with a 7 inch screen and I'm still trying to sort that out. It is usable, but uh, with care. So that is using the RTL-SDR as a poor man's spectrum analyzer. Uh, that's centered on 145.9. Why? Because I want to see the talkback channel at that end. Uh, anybody got a handheld? No. Anybody got a handheld? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, handheld. Right <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Oh no, Mike, Mike might have one. Um, let's shove the aerial on it. Hang on a minute. Anybody got one? Oh, there you go. Three. There we go. Yeah. Um, it, it's proved its worth once already on site. We had problems on 76 gigs. Uh, we chucked this thing on the IF and there were sprogs everywhere. Um, next outing, the sprog, sprogs had been cured. So uh, it's just useful. It's, it's in the box, so let's enable it. Um, it will also do a waterfall for you as well. Uh, you can set the centre frequency of that from a keyboard. RTL TCP server. Um, who here has used SDR, SDR Sharp? Okay, well this it can be a remote head for SDR Sharp on your network. So you can set it up as an RTL TCP server and control it from SDR Sharp. And that again is a button on menu two. Uh, video viewer. You've got a screen, you've got an easy cap, we must be able to look at video. You can, but not very well yet. On menu two, uh, video view, it's not going to work because there's no video input, it's going to go black, yeah fine. Um, it will give you a two frame per second video view. But what it does do, it's good when you're using a 5.7 gig receiver and you've got a noisy input 
because it just does a scan. It doesn't, sink, it doesn't try and sink it, but you can see if there are any sinks there or anything like that. If you do get a good picture, you can go to Video Snap, and that takes a snapshot of it. So you've then got a record of the signal that you received. And if you want to view those, you can view them on Snapcheck. And you remember when I was talking about the uh, video output menu, those snaps are available from there as well. Uh, video streamer. Using the camera or using the um, video input, you can stream into the BATC streamer. We've had this facility for quite a while. It's been reconfigured to use a new stream. And in the software release that I hope to get out next week, uh, you'll be able to configure which stream you want to stream to. You know, previously you used to have to type in the stream parameters from the console. You can now do it from here and you can select multiple streams. Now, I hear you say, well, that's not very useful. I've only got one stream. The stream. I've got my call sign stream. Um, a capability we've started trying to develop for repeaters is that they have a custom ports down that listens to a input stream and the members of your repeater group who you trust you give them the password to the input stream so they can stream into the repeater for transmission and outward streaming um, from the ports down. We've tried it on HV and it does, it does work so you can select your own stream or your local repeater stream or whatever and you put in the, uh, the parameters. Um, let's, it'll ask you for the stream name, it'll want that in lowercase. So for my personal stream, you know, GHGKQ in lowercase. For the HV input, it's GB3HV input, isn't it? Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. And then the next screen asks you for the key the six-character key, which we won't tell you, of course. <laughs> um, but that's your private key. <laughs> and you just enter that. And then that will be available to select from that screen. Question, Dave. Yes. All of the streaming parameters are fixed, aren't they? The streaming parameters are fixed, yes. Bit rate... Bit rate is 512 audio plus 64, sorry, 512 video plus 64 audio, or if you haven't got the audio, it's 576 video. Yeah. And those can be amended, they can be hand amended in one of the files. It doesn't need recompiling. But that seems to be the best compromise. The streaming receiver can run headless, so you don't need a screen or anything at the repeater. You just have the box, just have the pie. Yeah. It's got an I/O line as well. Which talks. Yeah, and when it when it receives a when the streaming receiver at a repeater site receives a valid stream, it toggles an I/O line high, which you can then feed into your switching matrix to switch the video. So. so go through the VATC stream. Then. Yes. We just yeah. set up a separate channel. Yeah. No, so, like, you'd have a TM input channel. No, you're uh, I understand that. Yeah. 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 So. HV's got it configured. If anybody wants to play with it, send me an email. Yeah. Works well. If you want to use the streaming functionality with another uh, streamer, you can do, but you can't set it from the front panel. You have to go into the console to set the uh, streamer address. But it. It will work, it's just not integrated into the, the front panel software. I'm HD transmissions from the C920 webcam. I meant to bring Kieran's webcam up from the hangar. It's down in the hangar. Uh, the C920 webcam from Logitech um, has an inbuilt H.264 encoder. And it's a very good H.264 encoder. 
you can now plug that into your ports down, set two mega symbols and seven eighths FEC because it is a fixed bit rate out of the camera, so it needs to be those parameters, and it will transmit uh, 1080p pictures that look immaculate from, uh, from the webcam with sound, with stereo sound. So um, what, that works really well, but it has to be two mega symbols wide. Okay, well, that's a uh, half hour run through of what we're doing at the moment. The sort of things I'm looking at for the future. Um, can I get a uh, smooth video display up on this screen from, from an input? You know, can we just make that box into a TV monitor? It would just be nice to have. Let's exit out of that. Uh, I think it's possible, I just haven't got around to sorting it out. The ADF5355 signal generator, how many of you have heard of this analog devices chip? Yeah, it's a, it's a nice little chip. They're about 60, 65 quid from eBay. Um, and it will generate a signal anywhere between about 35 megs and 13.6 gigs. So again, a very useful sig genera signal generator. Uh, I tried about a year ago. Uh, question? Yes, I have. I haven't looked at the price of it. Do you know how much it is? The question was, have we seen the newer one that goes to 24 gigs? No. Not seen one yet. no. I should imagine... Partner. Is it... What's the part number? 5371. ADF 5371, yeah. Um, I, I should imagine until the, until the Chinese get hold of it, it's going to be quite expensive. Yeah. Um... About a year ago, I tried to integrate the ADF5355. I failed. I've learned a lot about software since then. I know where I was going wrong. I just need the time to do it. Um, eBay have come up with some uh, good log power detectors. And there are some very cheap analog to digital converters around. I would like to get a power display just on, A, simply on the screen, but B, start looking at doing plots based on a sweep from the ADF4351. So we end up with a scalar network analyzer. Um, it's going to take some development work, but I'm determined to do it. Um, and the, the, the input to that first will be an XY display, because currently my uh, home-built spectrum analyzer, I use a scope as an XY display. Well, this will do the job very well, I think. Uh, Lime SDR. Yes, uh, I am working on making the thing work with the Lime SDR. There are some hurdles to overcome, but it's going to do it eventually. Not there yet. Uh, I've got some experimental stuff going on with that. A while ago, I recompiled FFmpeg. FFmpeg is the bit of software that does the video encoding for um, MPEG-2 in the ports down. And I made sure that I put H.265 support in it. I have a feeling that the Raspberry Pi hasn't got enough grunt to do anything serious with H.265 because it's hard to encode with it. But I want to give it a try. And perhaps at low bit rate, we might get somewhere. Is it much better than 264? It's about double the uh, compression of H.264, yeah. And there is Ken G4BVK runs uh, 333 kilo on 146.5 of H.265 and gets superb results on, two, on 146 megs. Uh, but he's using an i7 PC to do the encoding. Exactly. It's not going to, yeah, we're not going to be up there, but we might be able to do H.265 in, say, 66 kilobits per second. And the great thing about that is that goes about twice as far as 333 because you've got a smaller bandwidth. So we might be able to do something there. Um, select different stream outputs from the touchscreen. Yep, done that. Tick. 
DVBS 2 Moving on to Lime SDR and other SDRs, it, and DATV Express. It'd be nice to do DVBS too. I um, need to look at that. And we keep coming back to H.264 with audio. Wouldn't that be nice? Everest did say the other day he was going to look at it. If you're watching Everest, it'd be really good if you could. Okay. Um, before I get on to full questions. Down in the hangar, I've got a full ports down test and some repair kit. Um, not a lot of surface mount, but we could have a go. And today over here, we've got all the BATC shop stock. Don't forget its lower prices, including the special offer on the filter modulator boards. I've gone through what's in there and what's on my to-do list. Anybody else got any other ideas of things they would like to see? There must be somebody who's thought, can't it do that? Linda was asking me the other day, and I'll blame him. Good. <laughs> when you go into one of the menus, you have to come, is it into the M2? You have to go either back to the M3. Why well, can't you get to M3 from M1? That was it. Can't you get from Good question, well put. <laughs> 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 Because M3 was an add-on, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, we'll have a look at that. <laughs> we would actually have room. Yeah, we would actually, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'll have a look at the mechanisation of that then. <laughs> Good. Other things? Yep, David. Uh, Hi, hang on, sorry. Thank you. Microphone test meter. Just something to see, if, especially, especially for those of us who live in a Portsdown free zone. <laughs> you've got the Portsdown in the region. You'd like to test the mic, just check, them, check the audio works before you leave home. Yeah. Um, oh, oh. The, there are two things. One is microphone test. The other is, can we have an, or, some sort of audio analyzer? There's no reason why we can't have an audio analyzer <laughs> in there. I just need somebody who's good at audio to do, to do the work, and I can integrate it. And, and do it. It comes back to time. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, but how do you plot it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, microphone, please. Are there any pre-built ports downs? Uh, are there any pre-built ports downs? What for sale? Uh, no. No. Um, it's it is a kit project. It is a build-it-yourself project. Um, one, one went for sale uh, a couple of months ago that I saw today, um, but uh, it is a, a build-it-yourself project. And we don't intend to, to go into production because that's not really what we're about. Kieran. I've got a quick one for you. What about the possibility of um, restricting the menu options when you pick something? So, for example, if you pick the... H264 encoder that the only options that you're able to set are then compatible with that? I tried to do that and actually if you go to H264 you will notice that the audio button is greyed out. So I have tried to do that but there is a limit to what I can do with complexity and some of you may have noticed that when you try and select the C920 webcam, you can get stuck in a sort of loop where it won't let you get to the right the thing you're after. And that was because I was a bit clumsy with it. So I have tried to indicate that you can't do things. Yeah, that's the reason the attenuator level there is greyed out, because there is no attenuator selected, rather than restrict you from doing things. And I think that's got to be the right compromise. Thank you. There are other questions over here, please. Uh, hang on, please. Is there a dedicated case available uh, yet, please? Because um, that's a very nice one you, you've made there. No, the answer is there is no dedicated case available. Um, that's another aspect of the home construction. And it's not, it's not something club wise would get into. We might make recommendations about what looks good. And that's one of the reasons we're having the construction competition. And I'd ask you to take a look at the seven inch one in a case 
because that, I think, is the way to go. It looks really, really good. There's plenty of room to put more things in there. Um, and have a look at how he's mounted the screen as well, because that's one of the tricky areas. Okay. I'll be available throughout the rest of the weekend for uh, questions. Consultations. Consultations with a fee. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, but w we would like to see your ports downs today and tomorrow. The construction competition will run through till tomorrow lunchtime. So for anybody in the stream watching, it's not just being judged today. Bring your kit tomorrow and the winner will get announced uh, tomorrow afternoon. One for the question. Uh, microphone, please. What's the most common problem that you get posed to you from people who've built one and had problems with it? It used to be, the most common problem used to be power supply. People were having odd problems that were caused by not having a decent enough power supply. So the, the Raspberry Pi would start working hard, the, power, the volts would drop, it would throttle back, and in extreme cases, it would corrupt the SD card. So that used to be the biggest problem. Um, now, to be honest, I don't get that many problems. Thank goodness. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think I'm done. Thank you very much for listening.